I see you to have strength enough? Can I see you to show that their lives are unlimited? And before you take your seat, I'd like for you to congratulate five persons and tell them, nothing they do me, my life is unlimited. Who them be, where them they, nobody can stop me. My life is unlimited. Hallelujah. Thank you very much, pastors, apostles, papas, mamas, coordinator, and thank you so much, the youths, first square youths. Thank you for the opportunity to host the windows. God bless you. We are happy for this opportunity. God bless you. I'm going to be teaching briefly on what I have titled What to Do Why Waiting. What to do in your waiting season? What to do while waiting? Please, while I'm teaching, if you have any question, please do well to write on a piece of paper. But if, you, if you're not shy, you could ask questions. Because after I, I teach briefly, myself and my husband will be handling questions, the question section. What to do while waiting? What to do while waiting? The most important season in the life of every single person, the most important season in the life of youths, in the life of single persons, single people, both men and women, is your waiting season. Because what you do with your waiting season will determine the kind of choices you make when you're choosing a life partner. What you do in your waiting season what you do in your season of singlehood will determine how you choose a life partner. The choices we'll make concerning our marriage determines the consequences we'll face in our marriage. Choices bets consequences. And who you choose can lead you to a life of improvement or a life of imprisonment. It all boils down to your choices. So what you do while waiting is very important. And I knew and I had to be deliberate in my waiting period when I saw, when I experienced what it is to come from a broken home. I came from a broken home and I grew up in a home where my father would beat up my mom. My mom was a beating vessel. You know how you have a bucket that you hit almost every time. That's who my mom was to my father. And every time he was to come home, or we knew he was coming, our hearts were beating like what was the next thing. We never knew the, always what was it to expect from my dad. And I grew up in that kind of home, watching my dad beat my mom. And sometimes when he gives my mom money, we tell her to write lists, even the change, bring it back. My dad saw female children as nothing. We were five girls, we are five girls. And then he was looking for a male child, so he didn't see us as anything. So he was in search of getting a male child. And so my mom could not produce that. My mom gave birth to five of us through cesarean operation because she was in the quest looking for a male child. And when she was about, when she gave birth to the fifth child, and my dad knew that I was female, he abandoned her in the hospital. I'm going to be very real and share some of my experiences so that you know that your waiting season is very sensitive and very critical. And you must not afford to casualize your waiting season because too many persons end up casualties in marriage because they casualize their singlehood. And so, when he knew that she was female, the fifth child, he abandoned her in the hospital because he didn't see females as anything. And she was there in the hospital Right there in the hospital, after having her fifth surgery, she had to look for money because she was in debt to pay her own for her own bills. And my sister, which, was, which is the last born, had to call my father, father, when she was two years. That's when she realized that my dad was her dad. Like a little picture. Praise God. 
So from my experience, I realized that if I am not intentional about my life in my singlehood, I'll miss it in marriage. Because listen, many times, it is not deliverance that saves you. It is lack of knowledge that makes you ignorant and that keeps you on the same spots. People do not perish for lack of deliverance. People perish for lack of knowledge. It is applied knowledge that you channel to specific prayer points that saves you. So many times, quite a number of persons are ignorant and then they miss it and they choose wrongly because they do not listen and they do not apply the knowledge that they even listen to. Praise God. So what you do while you wait, it's very important. It is sensitive. It is very critical. And I wrote down four points. What you need to do while you wait. And the first point I wrote is finding God. Tell your neighbor, find God. I didn't hear that. Tell your neighbor, find God. Matthew chapter 6 verse 33. It says, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And every other thing, your relationship, your marriage shall be added unto you, your finance. But he says, seek you first. There are things you must do first. It is not seek ye your emotions. It is not seek ye the choice of a partner. He says, seek me first. Seek first my presence. Too many of us come to a point, it is when we are now looking for a partner that wants to seek God. And then you begin to hear different things. It's that time that you see yourself in white wedding gown and a boy wearing black suit. It is when you want to now choose a life partner that you begin to see funny revelations. You now begin to hear God when you don't even have the ability to hear him. You don't even know. Finding God is very critical to your choice of a partner. Because not everyone that looks good can be godly. But everything that is godly is good. So it is very important that you find God. Because let me tell you something. If the reason why you came for this program or you came to a Jebel camp is to look for a partner, you're already missing out on your assignments. Because there are too many counterfeits even in church. There are too many deceptions even in church. So if you do not know God for yourself, you will not be able to identify who really is the person. So finding God is very important. Before you begin to relate with someone and have a relationship, you must first have a relationship with God. Because relating with God eases your fellowship with a man or a woman. Not everything that is good is godly, but everything that is godly is good. How do I know? First Samuel chapter 17, Samuel looked at Eli. Eli looked good. He looked like the anointed and God rejected him. It reminded me of my past relationship many years ago before I met my husband. There is a pastor. It was my campus fellowship pastor, as you saw in that skit, but that was not, you know, I don't know she pastor. Praise God. He was my campus fellowship pastor, and I admired him. You know that kind of thing? When we are a young pastor is preaching, you'd be like, I wish this guy can come and propose or toast me. So I was in that shoe. The man will be preaching, I'll be wishing, having many wishes. You need to see him when he's praying. My God, his tongues were real. And I was like, God, I was admiring him. I was like, God, I wish this one can come and meet me. And one day he said to me that God said I'm his wife. I didn't need to do any research or hear God for myself. I went ahead and I said yes to him. And we started a relationship. And then he introduced me to many spiritual daughters who he was having an affair with that I did not know. And of course, what I agreed that there would be no premarital sex, so I believed because I had my own side to agree on. I didn't know that while I was away, going, when I went for service, he was having things to do with, even his ex was having stuff to do with her, as well as other spiritual daughters introduced me to. And then one day, I didn't even know till after we had broken up, till after he had broken up with me. So while I was serving, my father told me that I should go to study my master's, I should go and do my master's abroad. My guy then told me that um, God said we should marry. So it was not masters that I needed for that season. Of course, he was a pastor. 
So who was I not to believe him? And then he looked spiritual. So who was I not to believe him? So I believed him and I turned down my master's offer from my dad. I turned down the two jobs I had then in my present state of service. And then I followed. Only for me to pass out after our POP passing out and all that. Collected my discharge certificate. A week after, I felt I did not even go home. I went down to where he was, the city, past my parents' city. Drove all the way. Love was doing me. And I went down to where he was. And then he saw me off to the park. And I came back home. And then he sent me a text to tell me that God said I'm not the one for now. This was about 2 a.m. You need to see the dysentery that hooked me. It was one week non-stop. Praise God. And after we broke up, I didn't even know. And then later on, I got to start, I got to start understanding that I started getting different things. And in fact, I had to have confirmed some from him. I realized I was having issues. He was even having affairs to do with the so-called spiritual daughters. And I realized from my experience that title is not the same thing as spirituality. Titles does not equate spirituality. Going to church does not equate spirituality. Just because his title doesn't make him spiritual. A spiritual man demonstrates a life-giving spirit. A spiritual man, by their fruits, you shall know him. A spiritual woman, by her fruits, you shall know her. So it is not in quoting scriptures alone. That's why pity people, when they come to church... They come with the intention of looking for a partner. You can miss it because the church is like a hospital. Different kinds of people come in for treatment. So if you're not careful, you can get the wrong person. And then you can even be afflicted with his own disease. Praise God. So I knew that title does not equate spirituality. I knew from my experience that I needed to hear God for myself. Hearing God is not automatic. It's a gradual process. So you cannot just wake up one morning in search of a partner and then you, are, you just be, all of a sudden God has started speaking volumes to you. Praise God. Hearing God, having a relationship, a daily fellowship with God, studying your Bible daily beyond what your pastor preaches, beyond the Sunday sermon, beyond a midweek sermon, is what grows your relationship with God. It is beyond all that. It's beyond your morning devotion, rushing and then quickly you just want to go out. You want to do a lot of things. It's beyond all that. Sorry I have to emphasize on it because I came from a home and then every time my mom sits down, even till recently, she says she wished she had known God better. She would never have chosen my father as her husband. Anybody can be good to you, especially when they have the intentions of wanting you for marriage or wanting you for a relationship. Any guy can feel free, can want to be nice to you. I asked my mom a question. How did you end up with my father? And she said he was very nice and caring. And I realized from them that emotions don't decide right choices. Decidements decide right choices. Decidements. Emotions will fail you. Because if it were emotions, I would never have ended up with my husband. Yes, because it didn't look like it. Yeah. There were many guys around me. Toasters, different kinds of human beings. Yeah. But the ones I found in church and outside church. They looked like the real package. But they were not it when I became closer. And when my discernment signals were activated. My husband didn't look like it. In fact, when I introduced my husband as the one to my mom, my mom thought I was possessed. Because before I met my husband, I used to fly already. I had gone outside Nigeria and all that. So but my husband was busy on her long, chattering buses. He would stop on her long and be looking for a bus. Sometimes we even trek. And the only property he had was a laptop. So where was this one taking me to? Praise God. But because I had activated a fellowship with him, because I had activated a relationship with God, my discernment was properly activated. I knew he was the one beyond his looks. So you need to hear God for yourself. You need to have a relationship with God. Stop allowing your emotions do you jiggy, jiggy, jiggy. Stop allowing the recharge cards I sent so you put you under pressure.
pressure to say yes. Stop collecting it. Stop allowing her beauty to intoxicate you. Be being beautiful without spiritual sense can lead to failed marriages. So stop allowing that. You need somebody that has a spiritual sense. You need to have spiritual sense for yourself. In your waiting season, you must develop a relationship with God. When you seek him first, every other thing will be added unto you. You can never have a real relationship with God and he will grant you a fake spouse. It's not possible. But some of us struggle so much with our relationship with God. Some of us want to hustle it for ourselves. You know very well that the hustling has not helped you. Some of you have tried to use your emotions to try to fight it. Is he him? Is he her? Oh, I don't understand. Some of you have ended up going to meet fake prophets. They've given you all kinds of things to bath with. When you hear God for yourself, you, have, you find God. You have a presence with God. You enjoy his presence. Listen, everything will come to you with ease. After my first heartbreak, I used to think that I would never find any good guy. Because after that time, every person that was coming around me, they all wanted sex, sex, sex. Even married men. At the time, I thought I was possessed. And then he always tells me, I will give you something beautiful in my own time. And at that period, he needed me to develop myself enough to meet the right person. Praise God. And then after some years, I waited. After my first heartbreak, it took me four years before I get, got into any relationship. Start being desperate over God. Be desperate over the things of God. Stop being in a hurry. They break your heart today. You have jumped into another one. It doesn't bring any solution. You only end up having heartbreak, different types. That you cannot explain if you have an interview section. Praise God. So after my faith, I took time to develop myself. I took time to wait on God. I channeled my relationship with God rightly. I served in, God, within, in God's house more. I developed certain kinds of friends. There are a lot of things I had to do. I studied the word of God more. Because it is only in his place, in his presence, that you can find the right person. Tell your neighbor, find God. I didn't hear you say it again. Say, find God. Number two, find you. The first thing you need to do is find God. And the second thing you need to do is to find you. Genesis chapter 1 verse 22 says, And he blessed them. He blessed them. And he says, Be fruitful and multiply. And he blessed them. He blessed them. Every one of us seated here under the sound of my voice was blessed. Everyone seated here has a purpose. Has a life purpose. Everyone seated here has been assigned by God to do something with their lives. Because everyone seated here was created for impact. The first assignment God gave you is not in search of a spouse. It's to be fruitful and multiply. So every youth seated here is a multiplier. Every youth seated here is born to impact. When you find yourself, you sit down and ask God, what is that that you have deposited on my inside that you need me to maximize? You need me to bring out or impact a generation because you are the salt of the earth. You make a difference in your generation. When you are sad down to identify, you begin to move with it. It's in finding yourself that you find the person. The first thing God did was to give, put Adam in the garden. Take care of the animals. Take care of the trees. He gave Adam a job. He gave Adam an assignment. When Adam became busy, then God knew he needed help. Stop coming around somebody when you are jobless. And when I mean jobless, I don't mean that you don't have a job. I mean you are not doing something with your life. 
Stop looking for a partner when you have not found yourself. Have an idea of yourself. When you come into school and you gain admission, they give you a matriculation number. They give you an ID card that shows that you are now a student of that institution, isn't it? Good. Every one of us here has an identity in Christ, but you need to find it. You need to find it. When you find yourself and you're walking in line with God's direction, with your life direction, you cannot find the person. You would not be confused. When my husband met me, he said he was going into ministry. He said he was going into ministry. He said he was not even going to work under somebody at all. That this is him and all that. He did not try to convince me. He didn't try to market himself. He told me, this is who I am. This is my life's direction. Are you willing to follow me? And then I had peace in my heart. I had a leading. And then I said yes. He didn't even take me time. He didn't take me time. In seven days, I'll be less. I told him yes. When you are confused, you don't even need to give one year looking for response. Two years, wasting the boy's time. Find you. Find your assignment. Know who you are. When you have an identity and you're working in your life's purpose, you're automatically secured. You will understand that you don't need a man or a woman to secure you. Your life's purpose validates you. So you don't get that spirit because you know that you have an identity. You know you're not lacking one. You know that you are busy. I tell people, I say, listen, if you become idle and you're not busy, that's when you begin to jump into any relationship. Yeah, no matter the age. I have a friend that got married at the age of 35. She was a virgin. While she was praying to God to give her a spouse, she was busy with her life's assignments. She was busy. She worked as an OAP. She was already ministering in different churches and all that. And that's where her husband found her. Purpose makes you productive. Purpose makes you attractive. You don't need to hustle to be a sought after. See, attraction is not in the size of your boobs or how it looks like. It's not in your beauty. When you're working in life's purpose, in your life assignment, you're automatically attractive. You become a sought-after woman, a sought-after man. When I was single, a lot of people would go and meet my pastor and say they want me. I was an usher in my church. Oh, they want this girl. She's fine. I like the way when she talks. She's very intelligent. She's this, she's this. Every responsible guy is looking for an intelligent lady. And every intelligent lady is looking for a responsible man. It was purpose that made me attracted to my husband. It's not his height. He had content. When he talks in public, you're like, wow. He doesn't need to introduce me. I introduce him. Praise God. So it is very important that you find yourself. When you are not busy and you are idle, your mind becomes the devil's entertainment. So the devil begins to give you funny thoughts, begins to put certain things in your heart. And then you become filled with all manner of thoughts that you wouldn't know when you're walking in his direction. Moping for a single person is not attractive. You need to be busy. When you find yourself, you now can recognize who he is or who that person is, who she is. But it's important that you must find yourself. Number two, under finding yourself, you must discover your values. You must write down your values. You must live your values. Every person has what they live by. Your values are what you live by. Your values are your life regulator. I had my values while I was single, and I still have one. I still have them. I told myself that there will be no premarital sex. So I was not waiting on any man to define that for me. I had them as my values. I had it as my values. I had it as my life regulator. I did not wait on anybody. I was not waiting on any relationship to define that. You see people during counseling. Somebody walk up to you and tell you, and you know what, he's asking for sex. I don't know what to do. Are you kidding me? you would not ask when you define values for yourself. Your values is what fences you. It's what fences you from life pressure.
pleasure. It's what fences you from parasites. It's what fences you from praise. They are your boundaries. If a house is not a house that is fenced and a house that is not properly fenced, which one attracts um, more um, thieves or more um, praise? Sorry? A house that is not fenced. So if you don't fence yourself with values, your guidelines, anybody can come and detect anything to you and you'll be misguided. So I had my values. Premarital sex was a no. In fact, when my husband came to meet me, we talked from the first day. We said, once there's sex, the relationship has ended. We knew where we were going to. We knew, we told ourselves that we were going to become role models. And then there was nothing like the windows. The windows started in marriage. When we got married, we're not having anything called the windows. We didn't even know whether we, were, whether we ever act together. So, but we just told ourselves that we're going to be role models. We told ourselves that one day when we're talking to people, we want to be able to tell them that this is what we did. This is what we agreed on. This was the life we lived. So we told ourselves no premarital sex. And we stuck, we stuck by it. Was it easy? No. Were we vulnerable many times? Yes. But we, stood, we had to stand by it because we needed to be role models to people. And we needed to leave scriptures, not just talking scriptures. Number two, I told myself at the time, some of you will say, oh, well, I was there. Some people ask a lot of questions like, is kissing a sin? Is kissing not a sin? And all that. You know the truth. When we talk about premarital sex, kissing is one thing you should not indulge in. Some people will tell you that, ah, I beg, if we don't kiss in a relationship, it's very dry. What's dry? It's dry because you don't have anything to talk about. You're not going anywhere. We told ourselves the truth. Because when you kiss, your hands are not like this. You're not a statue. Even if it was a statue, you acted like a statue the first day. As you progress, the statue will begin to loosen up. You know the dangers. You know that before, when you started having sex, it started from kissing. That's the truth. The Bible, speaking of Rebecca in Genesis chapter 24, it says a Rebecca was stunningly beautiful and a pure virgin. So it's beyond just, oh, no, 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 I don't, I don't have sex. But you know that there are certain things that you do. So these are your values that if you do not live by it, if you are not fame by it, you will become misguided and you begin to have regrets. Oh, I wish I didn't do this. Oh, oh, why did he say it? I wish I was the one that told him. I wish this. I wish that. So set it for yourself now. And your values makes you unique. Your values makes you exceptional. Your values are something that you live by and they make you exceptional. A lot of people left me when I told them, oh, you know what, no sex. I had guys that went away. That's the truth. But I stayed on, even at the time, my husband that got married to me thought I was possessed. He was like, what's wrong with this girl? Uh-uh, she too do. She selects too much, but we're all in the same church. How what does she even have? This kind of this thing. But thank God I was rigid at my values because they were Christian. Christian values. If not, I'd have missed it or probably missed out on him. So it's very important. Number three, your character. Having a good character makes you an asset. You need to develop yourself. There are certain things you know as a person that you are not. Stop saying, that is who I am. No. When you are in Christ, automatically your mind is renewed daily. You become more broken. You become more transformed. A person who is in Christ is willing to change at every point in time. So there's nothing like that's who I am. You are rude. You know you are rude. You need to change. Rudeness does not sustain in marriage. It does not sustain any marriage. So you know that people have told you that you talk anyhow. Even you, you know, tell yourself the truth. It is now in your single that you need to start making adjustments. 
You know that when you're walking on the road, before somebody will talk, you know that before somebody will talk one, you have talked 10, 20. Your mouth runs. You need to work on it. Because if you're accepted for your beauty, it's your character that will keep you in marriage. It's your character. So they're not like who I am. This is who I am. A guy takes you out to a fast food. The guy has not ordered one thing. You have ordered 10 things. You are hungry. Oh, please. Oh, please. Can you bring this fufu? They're not telling you, what are you doing like that? I say, ah, I'm being real now. Farming is not good. Babe. Self-control is a good character. It's a good fruit. You need to learn to control yourself even in public. Some of us pray for kings and pray for queens, but we don't have the character that will attract such personalities to us. Even when they come to us, they leave us when they begin to see and re we, we begin to reveal our true self. If you are stingy, you know the truth. It is not only a guy that should be giving you. As a lady, you must give. mentality oh the man is the head of the home he has to be the one to provide there are no marriage is the union of two givers so you must come into you must have the mindset that it's not only the man that should give and no marry a stingy man Recharge card, what is it? Somebody in his mind, they're like, oh, What am I even saying? And oh, what if the guy is broke and all that? Stop making excuses for the person. My husband was broke, broke as in broke. brother with our wedding list. Praise God. So it's important you work on these things because character, character is a great asset. It's a great virtue that you need in marriage. And lastly, find the right connection, the right association. Iron, sharpened iron. Find the right association. So many of you are, you have wrong friends. Very wrong friends. Some of you, your friends have pushed you to do the very things that you should not do. You know it. And when I talk about right association, I don't necessarily mean just friends. 
What do you listen to? Who do you give your ears to? Who do you meet for counsel? Which, where, which environment do you find yourself? These things are very important. Who are your friends? What do you listen to? What environment do you find yourself in? These things guard your information. These things guard your sharpness. These things guard your growth. These things guide your choices. Somebody told me that she went to talk with her friend. A guy was asking her out for marriage, was wanting marriage, I mean. And then the guy told her, she, the guy had already told her and all that. The guy is 35 years and he's a virgin. So she told her friend about it, and the guy is a gynecologist. Yeah, so she told her friend, her female friend, friend was like, ah, no, that guy is lying. How can a 35 years old guy be a virgin? And also, and then he's a gynecologist. Kai, the guy, they lie, he's a liar. Praise God. And I'm like, how does she know? Because the guy is 35 years. So in other words, somebody who is 35 cannot be a virgin. That everybody is doing doesn't mean some people are not exceptionals. But that many people are doing doesn't mean that some people are not exceptionals. And she told me about it. And to cut long story short, I told her, I said, this is this. I, I guided her. I asked her, do you think this guy is Christian? She said, yes. She has prayed about it and she has peace in her heart. She has seen some things, some revelations. And she knows that this guy is real. And I said, the guy is, that the guy is 35 years and is a virgin does not mean he's lying. I've seen guys who are like that. I have a friend that got married and the guy has never had sex. In fact, he got married close to 40. Yeah. And so that was how she finally accepted this guy. And they're getting married in November. And the relationship has been so good. I mean, she has seen too many fruits to know that this one is not lying. So imagine if she had listened to that friend. She would have missed out on the right person. Some of you have lost some guys, some real relationship because of who you listen to. We must guide our association. We must guide it. Even when the iron is blunt, it won't sharpen you well. It won't sharpen your countenance. It won't sharpen your character. So you must, you must every day sharpen yourself with fresh knowledge. The knowledge of yesterday is not what can save you for today. Every day you must increase your knowledge capacity. You must listen to more things that will guide you, spiritual materials. We must read spiritual books that will guide you, that will guide your information. It's very important so that you don't miss it. Praise God. So your association can get a wrong or right manifestation. Information leads to a wrong or right manifestation. So it's very important that you guide what you listen to, who are your friends, and the environment you find yourself in. When you do all of these things that I mentioned, find God, find you. Under you, find your purpose. Have good character, work on yourself. It's only a dead person that lacks growth. As long as you are living, you are growing every day. So you must be deliberate about your growth process. Never say, this is who I am. Every day, you must seek to change and work on yourself. Every man, every one of us was born free. Whatever we picked, we developed for ourselves. So the bad things you develop, you can drop it and change to become a better person. Number three, work on your character. And lastly, be guided, find the right association. When you do all these things, your waiting period is not in vain. When you do all these things, when you see the person, you will not be confused because already you have so much of his presence that you can identify his presence. Thank you.